And we're back. Welcome everybody to Relative Rivalry, the most original game show you've ever seen and one that certainly won't trigger any copyright issues when this airs online. I'm your host, William Dear Kingdom, but you can just call me Bill, Bill Dear Kingdom. And we're back with our final question of the day, where we pulled 250 random people off the street and asked them this question. What would you do first if you had all the power in the world? We've got the top five answers on the board right here, and we're gonna start with number five. It is pay off bills. We don't know if it's just your bills, all of our student loan bills, everybody else's bills, but you guys want to pay some bills. That feels like it makes sense. Number four, reverse climate change. Now, I heard once that if we all started getting the earth to spin backwards fast enough that maybe we could undo some of the horrible things that we've done. I don't know if that would work, but you guys want to give it a try. Number three is cure all disease. Okay, now we're starting to really help some people out. That's, that's a good one. I like that. That's a good one. Number two, we've got a twofer at number two. You all want to end poverty and hunger. How good of you guys tried to sneak in a little extra one in there. I, I see what you did. I see what you did. Number one, and are we really surprised? You guys all want world Peace. That's what these people asked for. And that's all well and good. Gets you feeling all fuzzy inside, doesn't it? Now, we also pulled all of you regular loyal followers and viewers of the Relative Rivalry Show right here at Hope Church Lake Country. We wanted to hear what you had to say. What would you do if you had all the power in the world? We just wanted to see how they would compare. You know, have some fun with it. It's a game show after all. These are your guys' top five answers, starting with number five. Number five, right down at the bottom, is help family and friends. That's really awesome. We're going to remember that as Thanksgiving and Christmas roll around right now. You guys said you wanted to help some family and friends. Number four, you also wanted to cure all disease. Very nice, very, very helpful of you. Number three, you snuck in a twofer as well. You also want to end poverty and hunger. How very interesting. And at number two, we have... Oh, I wouldn't expect anything less from a church full of churchy people. You guys want to help people know Jesus with all the power in the world. You can build the biggest megaphone ever and help spread the word. And at number one, are you ready? Yeah, of course, nobody's surprised, right? You guys want world peace too, whether we're here at Oak Church or whether out in the world, everybody wants world peace. But judging by the number of political ads in my mailbox, I don't know if we're quite there yet. That's William Jer Kingdom signing off here. Thanks for watching another episode of Relative Rivalry. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Hope Church gathered here in the room, and also all of the people who are gathered online. You know, sometimes we don't talk about our online as often as we might like, but there's a lot of people who are watching right now from home because they have a sick child at home, or maybe they're sick themselves, or perhaps they work on Sundays, so they're, they're going to watch this message, or maybe they forgot to set their clock for uh, the time change. But if you're at home, you're watching us, you're live, or you're whenever you're watching it, thanks for being here. My name's Sean. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Hope Church. And I found myself feeling really refreshed by both of the survey groups having very similar answers uh, as uh, Michael. You know, Michael's our youth pastor. If Hope youth doesn't work out for him. I think he might have a career as a, a game show host. It, it could work for him, but, but he did a great job. And as he showed those answers, I, number, I think maybe the most excited I was was that the Hope survey group had something about Jesus in, in their answers. That, that, was, that was a good thing. But what we saw was the, the same number one answer, world peace, came from, from both groups, and that the answers were beautiful. They were, they were heartfelt. They were things that we want to see 
in the world. And so if, if you were part of, of that survey group and if you participated in it, thank you very much for sharing. And as, as we're going to see, there's a, there's a reason behind why we did it. But to have a, a little bit more fun, I want to tell you about some of the one-off answers that we got. You're going to really love these. So uh, here's one of the answers we got. Remember, the question is, if you had all the power in the world, what would you do first? So here's one of the one-off answers that we received. <laughs> Thankfully, this was an anonymous survey. Um, I don't think all the power in the world could necessarily <laughs> achieve, uh, achieve that. Um, I, I said an online audience, apparently Dallas Fort Worth is represented, so welcome uh, for the one person who was there. Uh, although I, I feel like, you know, God's a Packer fan, but it, it's the past number of weeks. I'm getting a little bit, little bit worried about that. So, okay, so that, that was one of the one-off answers, okay? Here's another one. Make it so cereal bags never rip the wrong way. So uh, is my, I think my dad's here. I, I mean, he must have definitely submitted that one because uh, the struggle's real. And... Uh, in my house growing up, woe to the person who did not open the bag of cereal the correct way. And then my dad was digging out frosted flakes from cardboard, you know, for the rest of the week. Or you have the cereal bag explosion, you know, so, th so that happens too. So um, some of the other ones that were kind of interesting that we had were uh, speeding. People wanted to speed. That was uh, if they had all the power in the world. Fly. So I, I, people kind of have a fixation on going, going fast here at Hope Church. Um, there was some colorful answers about certain political people. Um, none from the Hope group that came in. <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were interesting, let's just, just to say that. So uh, the question I have for you today as, as we start off is, how would Jesus have responded to that question? If you had all the power in the world, what would you do first? Because a lot of the things and topics that we saw and that were brought up are things that were present during Jesus' time in the ancient world. There was certainly violence, oppression, corrupt governments. There was, there was hunger. There was poverty. There was disease. Those things were, were all part of Jesus' day. And so when we, we ask, how would Jesus have responded to that? Would he, would he have addressed those things? Did he address those things? Was he concerned about those things? Did, did those things keep him up? All of those issues, those, those problems, those those heartfelt answers that were shared about things that we would change? Was, was that something that Jesus also found himself consumed with answering? And, and I want to say to you, I don't think Jesus' response would be what we might expect. Because Jesus didn't solve the world's problems. That's the first fill in the blank for you if you're using the message notes or if you're you're online. And, and the reason I say that, you might say to me, like, how can you be a pastor and say that, that Jesus didn't solve the world's problems? What do you mean by that? Well, Jesus was concerned about people who were sick. We know that, right? Jesus was concerned about people who were hungry. We know that because he took care of people who were sick, people who were hungry. He, he had a heart. He had a, a love for those individuals. But there was something deeper to Jesus' ministry and, and to his way of addressing those needs that, that I want to show and share with you here as, as we move into some scripture and as we look at a particular way, a particular aspect of how Jesus addressed problems and what he taught to others to do so. So we're going to be in John's gospel and... John is one of the four evangelists, so in the New Testament, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
And all four of these individuals wrote biographies of Jesus' life. So we're going to be in the very last one that you find in the order of the New Testament, which is John. So John's Gospel, we're going to be in chapter 13, and it says, this is verse 1, It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world. He was getting close to the end of his life and, and go to the Father, back to heaven. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So, so what are they doing? So Jesus is at the Passover festival. It's just before it, so they're getting ready for it. He's with his friends, his disciples. Passover was a, was a Jewish holiday to remember when Moses and the people of Israel left Egypt and they moved to the promised land and they made that journey. And so years later, in the course of tradition and history, you celebrated that incredible event as the people left, as they fled. And, and you, many of you have heard that story. So that's the Passover. So that's why they're gathered. It's a, it's a big holiday. Jesus is with his friends. And he knows his time's coming to an end. It's, it's very close to the end. So here's what happens next. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Pause, pause. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Survey question, right? If you had all the power in the world, what would you do first? So Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. It means exactly what it, what it looks like it means. Jesus had all the power to do anything that he wanted. The Father had given him that power what is Jesus going to do with this power? He's going to remove the Roman occupation from the holy land of the people of Israel. No, sorry, not that one. Um, he's going to end slavery. He's going to end slavery. I mean, that, he should have done that with all that power. No, he didn't do that. He's going to stop the practice of infanticide. People would just abandon their, their children, their little ones, their babies. If they didn't want them. It happened all the time in the ancient world. He could do that with all this power. No, nope, he didn't pick that one either. What did he do? So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. All the power in the world, right there at his fingertips. And he decides to wash some dirty, stinky feet for his friends. This is really significant, uh, friends who are here, those online. Why is this significant? Because... In the ancient world, uh, roads and streets were dirty. Human waste, animal waste, dusty. People wore some pretty insignificant fitting sandals, especially if you were poor, which, which the disciples and Jesus were. Uh, you can imagine what their feet looked like when they walked into a house. And normally you would have hired uh, some type of servant to wash feet when you would gather, or maybe you'd have a slave who would do that for you. But as you can imagine, it wasn't a very um, exciting job. It was a pretty dirty job. And so as they're gathered, Jesus, with all the power in the world, kneels down, right? Kneels down to his friends and washes their feet. Rabbis and teachers don't kneel down to their students. It doesn't happen. Kings don't kneel to anyone. People kneel to them. And yet Jesus did just that, knowing that he could have done anything in that moment with the power that he had to care for those who were in front of him. Why? Why did he do this? Moving on. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, 
For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. If I, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus was showing his friends a way of going out into the world to care for others. And the reason he did this was because these guys ain't seen nothing yet. Jesus is going to be gone very, very soon. He's going to be betrayed by one of his friends in this room. He's going to be denied by potentially one of his closest friends. He's going to be abandoned by, by all the rest, except for John, who's writing this, this gospel. He, he actually sticks around. But these guys are going to be scattered. These guys are going to be hunted down. These guys are going to experience disunity, fear like they've never imagined in their life. They're going to be scared. They're going to be confused. And they're not going to know what to do. And Jesus knows this. And he washes their feet because he says to them, when that moment comes, when Peter and, and John and, and James, or you, when you're fighting amongst yourself, when that happens, you need to wash each other's feet. You need to care for each other. You need to be there for one another. Because things aren't going to get very easy. You thought it was maybe a little difficult now? Get ready. Because once I'm gone, they're going to come after you. But the beauty of that image is, is that's, that's kind of what's, what's carried. The church that evolved after Jesus left, right? Because as, as people started to hear the mission and the message of Jesus' words, they joined what, what you've maybe heard of called the way. These, these were like the first Christians to gather together in homes. And they, they started to see people in a different light. They started to see the world in a different way. What do I mean? Well, they started to take care of each other who were following this way. They started to bring food for people who were hungry. They started to take care of those who were sick and abandoned, and discarded. They, they started to look for ways of caring for infants who had been left to die, or widows who had no one to support them financially. They, they started to adopt practices that would turn into hospitals and orphanages and places that we would see today in our community of where people are washing feet still. Places that you're going to hear about shortly from uh, Pastor Jason for our, our Christmas offering, which is always uh, an incredibly wonderful big event, but organizations that are washing feet to this day that have carried that example, right? I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And what's interesting, if we go back and if we look at those survey answers that we had, such beautiful responses from people's hearts, wanting world peace, curing disease, alleviating hunger and poverty, and, and those were the majority of the answers. I, I, I calculated them and I, and I saw them. And yet, for having these beautiful answers, I, I think to myself, amongst, amongst myself and, and people who submitted them, we have this great desire to see good. And at the same time, maybe we can't be in the same room with a family member because they watch Fox News or CNN. Or maybe we don't speak to a neighbor in our community because of the political signs that they have in their front yard. Or we don't speak to a family member anymore because of the person that they decided to marry. 
or who they voted for. I remember early on in my um, ministry, when, when I was just starting in ministry, I, I did a funeral for uh, a woman who was, who the, she was the mother, grandmother, the matriarch of this very um, well-known family at the church that I was at. And she, um, wonderful woman, and the family was like that, just like that pinnacle family. Like everyone wanted to be like them. They, they volunteered. They, they gave and were generous to the church. They, they were all very successful. And there was, there was a whole group of, of siblings. And um, I celebrated this funeral for, for their mother. And afterwards at the reception, I, I happened to just be talking to somebody and, and having a beer or something. And I heard behind me, one of the siblings said to another sibling, now that she's gone, we never have to see each other again. And I, I just, I, would, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it because I, I knew these people. I knew this family. I would have never guessed it in a million years. And they said, now that she's gone, we never have to see each other again. And that struck me because we've, maybe in this room, you've experienced that with family members or people you know or coworkers. And we have such beautiful dreams of what we would do with all the power in the world, of what we would pick first. And, and maybe we need to start with just peace in our own family. If we want peace in the world, maybe we need peace amongst our own family first or the people who are closest to us. And I think and I believe that that's what Jesus was saying when he showed his friends this foot-washing example. He said, start, start where it's close. Start at home because we solve the world's problems by washing feet. Attack the problem in front of you. Address the problem in front of you from a sibling or a neighbor or a coworker or a friend. I want to say keep dreaming big. Have those big ideas of of what the world could look like if we did things differently or if we had that power. And Jesus says, come, come back here. Address something in front of you. Address an issue in front of you by just washing someone's feet and begin there. Kind of like start small. But remember when I said at the very beginning, Jesus wasn't concerned with the world's problems and a little bit of a, explanation, something maybe to clarify about that. Jesus was worried about one problem. And that, that was the problem of the heart. The heart that did say, I want world peace, but I can't get along with my next door neighbor. Or the heart that says, I want people to be cure of all diseases. And yet, sometimes I wish for the worst thing in the world on one of my enemies. Hearts that are beautiful, but also at the same time flawed. And that's what we would call sin, right? That's, that's the sin. The, the sin that comes from the same heart that also can wash feet and do amazing, extraordinary, beautiful, incredible things is also that same heart that can think up and do the worst types of things. And that was the problem that Jesus was most concerned about. Our friend John, after he wrote, his gospel of Jesus, he also wrote a, a letter, um, a couple letters. And this is from one John, so the same guy who was there with Jesus. He's the one who stuck around, actually, and, and stayed with Jesus until the end. He writes in chapter 2, verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. The whole world the sins of, of us, the sins that came before us, the sins that will come after us. Jesus was the atonement. He was, he was the, the reparation. He was the one who would mend it, make amends for those sins because Jesus solved the world's problem, that, that problem of sin. 
the problem of having a heart that can do so many good things, but also a heart that can think up and do the worst types of things. And that's what Jesus was concerned about. That's what Jesus came to alleviate. That's why he went to the cross after he was with his, his buddies and he washed their feet. That's why he left this world to go back to the Father and why we gather afterwards here doing this is because we know Jesus was concerned with the world problem of sin. And we come and gather to pray and to build our lives and change lives and eternities and wash feet of others. So let Jesus worry about the sin part, which he did, and you go and wash feet. Which brings me now, kind of perfect transition to our Christmas offering. So this is the 10th year of Hope's Christmas offering. It's hard to believe because I think some people think it's always been like this really big event. Um, you know, we talk and say it's our third favorite Sunday of the year after Easter and Christmas. And uh, it wasn't always uh, something that was so uh, big, right? It wasn't always, you know, all this money that was raised um, and just given all away. We don't keep a, a penny of anything. Um, it started with some really humble beginnings and... Uh, what I would say, a person who was interested in maybe showing how to wash feet with uh, a beautiful desire from the heart and something that she saw was an issue um, or a problem that she sought to fix by washing feet. So uh, here's a video where you can see a little bit of the beginning of the story of Hope's Christmas Offering. And then our friend, Pastor Jason, our lead pastor, is going to come out and, uh, and talk about some of the organizations. So really exciting. I'm Allie Hofstead. I've been a member of Hope probably for definitely over 10 years. I am from Wisconsin. I'm currently here in Switzerland. So hello from Switzerland. I am a auditor, a CPA with a global accounting firm, so I'm currently on rotation here. Ten years ago, you were a high school senior yep. living in Lake Country, and you saw a problem that existed that you felt compelled to help solve. Can you tell us about that? I was part of the youth group at Hope, and we would volunteer at the Lighthouse Youth Center in downtown Milwaukee, and it came up that you know, 150 Bibles would be a really great addition. And um, it coincided and worked perfectly with me. Actually, my senior year, I had a psychology class and one of our assignments was go out into the world and make a diff, like do something that makes a difference. And then once I discussed with you in our discussion, you're like, that's a great idea. What if we asked for more? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was like this awkward you know, amount of money where, you know, to, and to a high school senior, it might as well be a bajillion dollars, you know, to talk about right. $1,500. Um, it was too big of a project for your mom's small group to take on solo, yep. but it was too small a project to get the whole church involved. Right, exactly. Yeah, so, we, yeah. so we found a couple other, you know, charities and we just kind of took the whole thing to the church. What, what made you think, you know, just as a high school senior, what made you think that you could be the one who could make a difference? Um, to be honest, I didn't think that. <laughs> um, I think it's kind of mind-blowing to see how one small idea can turn into this ginormous and great you know, experience and opportunity and a way to give back to the community. So I think that's really awesome. So what would you say to the people who have never experienced what we're doing before and this is their first year to jump in with the Christmas offering? I would tell people to really get involved, um, and especially now our church has grown so much. Even just 5 to $10 can amount to a huge amount that we can give to various charities. It's a really great feeling to know that you're giving back to the community. You know, I miss everyone back home and I tell them everyone hello.
You know, when I look at Allie's story and where we were at 10 years ago with the Christmas offering compared to where we are today with the Christmas offering, there's a Bible verse that it brings to mind every single time. It's from Zephaniah chapter 4, where we're told, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. When we began with this venture 10 years ago, it was a small beginning. But do you know what was happening in heaven when we started to be like Jesus and meet the needs of people right in front of us? The Lord rejoiced to see the work begin. And that first year, we rallied everyone at church and challenged them to give away as much as we could to help some great organizations. And we gave away about $7,500. And the Lord rejoiced to see the work begin. By our five-year anniversary, we had given away over $100,000 total through the Christmas offering. And by last year, we had given away over half a million dollars to, uh, to our partner organizations as the Christmas offering. Don't despise small beginnings. The Lord rejoices to see the work begin. And I say that because for many of us in the room, for many of us watching online, this is the first time you're going to participate with us in the Christmas offering. But listen, when you decide to jump in and make a difference, God is rejoicing to see the work begin. And if that's you, here's what the Christmas offering is all about here at Hope Church. We go and we find some of the best organizations in southeastern Wisconsin that are helping meet people's basic needs in our community and in communities around the Milwaukee area. We focus on organizations that are solving problems with people when it comes to homelessness, hunger, health care, addiction recovery, and as a church, we believe that eternity is a real need because Jesus said that everyone spends eternity somewhere, so we do want more people to get to know Jesus. And we support great organizations that are making a difference in these areas. Now, historically, what we've done with this is we go and find some organizations, we knock on their door, and we just say, hey, how can we help you? How can we support you? Tell us about what you do. And we do some vetting, and and if they're a great organization, we say, great, we don't want to compete with you. You're not our competition. We want to take the spotlight we have at Hope Church, and we want to shine it on you, and we want to resource you, and we want people to go and volunteer for you because you're doing great work in our community, and you're meeting people's needs, and you are doing things that matter to Jesus. So, hey, we just want to know. No strings attached. We just want to help you be more successful. And over the years, uh, we've always been very selective. We have fewer partners rather than more partners because we don't want to bring on new partners until we feel we can actually move the needle for them and make a difference for their organization. This year, we are sponsoring eight partners through the Hope Church Christmas offering. Here's who we're supporting this year. Number one, we're supporting the Lake Area Free Clinic. Uh, The Lake Area Free Clinic uh, offers free medical and dental care to patients who live within the boundaries of our school district who fall below a poverty line. Last year, here's what we did, or here's what they did with our gift through the Christmas offering. They bought all the medication for all of their patients for four months of the year. They bought diabetic supplies for all of their diabetic patients for four months of the year. And we funded dental care for 700 patients through their dental clinic. That's what we did for them last year. And now this year, they're expanding their services both to Spanish-only speaking patients and they're expanding what they can do with mental health care for patients. We are going to help them. So they're one of our partners this year with the Christmas offering. Second, we're helping Family Promise. Family Promise helps uh, homeless families in our area. Through our gift last year, Family Promise found shelter for uh, 85 families. That's almost 250 people. And what Family Promise is, once they have shelter, it's not just giving them a place to stay. It's targeting the problems to help them get back on their own feet and get them back out into the world again. That's what we did through them. We're going to support them again this year. We're going to support the Economowoc Food Pantry, uh, organized uh, completely by volunteers, and 100% of what happens there goes directly to providing food for people in our community. We're going to help them with that. Uh, Next one, the Bethany Recovery Center. They help women, particularly women who are pregnant or have very young children, regain sobriety and break free 
from addiction. Last year, here's what our gift did. It completely funded an inpatient stay for a brand new single mom who was stuck in addiction. We provided treatment, shelter, and food both for her and for her child so that she could regain sobriety. Think of the multi-generational impact that has when someone breaks free from addiction, when a single mom breaks free from addiction. In addition to that, they used our gift to help lease a vehicle to transport moms and babies. They bought baby carriers, strollers, infant clothing, diapers, uh, baby monitors, bedside bassinets. They're doing great things. We're going to keep supporting the work that they are doing. Uh, next, uh, the OG Christmas partner that Allie wanted to support, uh, the Lighthouse Youth Center. Uh, what they do is in the central city of Milwaukee, they provide a safe place in the neighborhoods for kids to come after school to get help with education and spiritual formation. Over the years, they've opened three locations in Milwaukee. Next year, they're looking to open their fourth, and we're going to help them do that. And next is one of our brand new partners from last year, Central City Church Planters. Uh, we brought them on board because they're a church planting organization for the central city of Milwaukee. They target the poorest neighborhoods in the city. They raise up and train church planters to plant more churches in the city. That's an incredible opportunity to change the culture of entire neighborhoods. Right now, they're working with seven potential church planters that they're training. This fall, they're launching their first church in Milwaukee, and they're using our gift from last year to do that very thing, and we're going to keep supporting them. In fact, next Sunday, next Sunday, I've invited Kurt Owens. He's a lead pastor at You Flourish Church, a multi-ethnic church in Milwaukee. He also helped get Central City Church Planters started. I've invited him to come to speak to us on how the suburban and the urban churches can work together in southeastern Wisconsin, how the black church, the white church, and the multi-ethnic church all need to come together to be the church of Jesus in southeastern Wisconsin. So you're also going to hear a little bit more about this organization when he's here next week. Uh, finally, we're going to support both the Summit Police Department next door as well as the Economy Walk Police because many times these are the first responders when people have a basic need. See, we have great organizations to help people with homelessness, with shelter, with food, with all these things, but the problem is they close at 5 p.m. and they're closed on the weekend, which is exactly the time when many people need that help. And too many of our officers are using their own resources to make sure people have a place to stay for the night, make sure they have food for the night so they can make it to the next morning or to the end of the weekend. We don't think it's right that our police officers are using their own resources to do that. So we are going to be the ones who step in and say, hey, we'll cover what people need to make it through until the organization's open. We're going to partner with them and help them do that. Now, here's what we're going to do as a church. We are going to raise as much money as we can for the next two weeks, and every single dollar you give to the Christmas offering, 100% of it goes to these fantastic organizations to make a difference in people's lives. And what we know from our history is that there is no unimportant act of generosity. If this is your first Christmas offering, this is your beginning, the Lord will rejoice to see the work begin. And the reason why I say that is because for some of us, inflationary prices are eating into your budget. Maybe things are a little tighter this year. Generosity is not measured by how many dollars you give away. Generosity is saying, here's the pie that God gave me. I'm going to share a slice of it with someone who's in need. That's what generosity is, and that's what I'm asking all of you to do through the Christmas offering. Now, if you're new, here's the question I ask every year. It's totally cheesy, and I'm going to keep doing it because that's who I am. How much money would you be willing to give away if you knew it's going to keep a family from becoming homeless? How much money would you be willing to give away if it's going to keep someone fed? How much money would you give if it's going to help a single mom regain sobriety? How much money would you give if that's the impact that it made in our world? How much money would you give if it helped another gospel-centered church be planted in the city of Milwaukee so the love of God can fill and grow in another neighborhood after another? How much money would you be willing to give away for that? 
$59.99. What if I told you that for only $49.99, you can partner with everyone here and make a difference in people's lives? Not a monthly payment, a one-time payment to do good in our world. Now, for some of you, that's, that's a good gift. If, if every person in the room and every person watching said, yes, count me in 50 bucks, I'll give it away. But, but here's the truth. For many of us with our pies, we, we don't need to give away $50. We need to move that decimal spot over one. You need to give away $500. Or maybe some of you, God's calling you to give away $5,000 to be generous and help people in need. Maybe others of us, we're, we're more like Allie, whose who's big vision and big broken heart over what could be and should be said, we just have to do something. Maybe you're in high school. Maybe you're the one with the minimum wage job. That's fine. Maybe you move the decimal point over this way, and your act of generosity is to give away $5, but there is no unimportant act of generosity because God rejoices to see the work begin. So let's be generous and make a difference in our generation. There's three ways to give to the Christmas offering. You only have two weeks to do this. Two weeks from today is the last day we are accepting gifts to the Christmas offering because it all gets given away before Christmas. It, it, it is done and over. We send all that money out the door. In the seat back pocket in front of you, for those in the room, there is an envelope that says Christmas offering. If you put your every gift put in that envelope and drop in the box on your way out, that's part of the Christmas offering. You can go to our website or click the link in the chat, hopelakecountry.com slash give. I'll show you more about that in a second. Uh, but you can give that way to the Christmas offering. You can go to your bank and you can just send a check from your bank. Just make a note. This is for the Christmas offering. Whatever's noted for the Christmas offering, that's where it goes and it all goes out the door. If you go to our website, uh, when you give, uh, just click the drop-down menu. It says Christmas offering 2022. Whatever you give that way, it's all going to the Christmas offering this year. Now, the reason why we do this, the reason why this is so important for us is because this is what Christmas is about. It is about the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. See, if, if you're new to church, if you're new to Christianity, Christians believe that God is the most generous being in the universe because he gave more than anyone ever gave. And he gave so that we could benefit, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have eternal life. And as children of God who've been given this gift, we mimic our Father in heaven and we practice generosity and we are generous and willing to share. And Jesus showed us this is how we solve the world's problems. He said in John 13 that we just read, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. The world's problems are not solved by watching cable news. The world's problems are not solved by complaining about politicians. The world's problems are not solved on social media. The world's problems are solved when we see a need and we decide, I am going to meet it. So, you have 15 days. I hope you give today. I mean, you've, you've made dumb impulse buys before. Just make an impulse give, okay? Just don't even think about it. Just, just write the check. Just go to the website. Just give, give, give. And let's follow the example of Jesus. Ready? Set? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your extreme generosity. Though you were rich for our sakes, you became poor. So that we, through your poverty, we have become rich. Help us to see our real wealth isn't here, it's in heaven. Our real treasure isn't here, it's in heaven with you. So thank you for the pie you've given each and every one of us. We want to be generous and willing to share a slice of it because that's the model you set for us, Jesus. You set us an example. We are your children. We want to honor you and bless a generation. Thank you for the amazing gift you gave us of the opportunity to bless the world. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Hey everyone, my name is James and I'm on staff here at Hope Church and I just want to say thank you for checking out that last video. If you found that content helpful, please let us know by hitting that like button and be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way you get notified every time we go live or post new content. We do live stream our services every Sunday starting at 825 Central. We have a growing online community that we would love for you to come and be a part of. And if you have any more questions about us here at Hope Church, be sure to check out the links down below.